Hey Giants, I am excited. I'm Nicholas Townsend Smith, author of The Giants and the Smalls, The Adventure of Remy and Ritt. And I'm going to take you through in this video, the 12 journeys on becoming a giant. So my goal with this is to read the book and then pause as I go through the book and share with you the principles as they come up. So I won't be responding to any comments as I go through this. I'm going to be teaching Fast and Furious probably for about an hour and a half straight. And so if there were commentary in there, this would go quite a bit longer. And so as I read the book, I'm going to pause throughout and then share with you the message of the uh, the giants and the smalls and why this is such an important message right now in the world. Because one thing that I'm seeing out there is that as we take ownership of our lives exactly as they are, it opens up the possibility of things to be different. And so uh, as I go through this, on the 12 journeys. If you have any questions at the bottom, you'll see scrolling across where you can learn more about this program. Um, but we're going to be going through uh, unconsciousness, awareness, grief, acceptance, gratitude, uncertainty, vision, surrender, and nurture. These are the 12 journeys. These are the things that are taught throughout this book. And that's what I want to bring to you. So I'm going to start with reading. I'm going to zone myself out a little bit here so that you can uh, see the screen more than me, and uh, we're just going to get going. So I'll teach as I go here, so you'll hear me pause. If at any point you want to stop and uh, take notes, please do that. Pause the video, take notes, write down your thoughts, what comes up for you. That's way more important than what I share here. So here we go. Beyond the night sky and further than the faintest star, past the darkest parts of the heavens, is a world so big it would make our earth look like a single grain of sand. The inhabitants of this great sphere live strange lives that were to a certain degree much like ours, but the most curious thing about them was that some were giants and many were smalls. The giants and the smalls lived amongst each other and shared the world as so many of us do. They breathed the same air, had similar opportunities, and in many ways were alike. However, they were massively different in size. The smalls kept to themselves eating tiny crackers and pea soup and having small talk. They believe that smalls were small and a small is born a small, lives a small and dies a small. They had strong beliefs about themselves. They never had thoughts of their little neighbors, even in insignificant ways. Smalls were afraid to do brave things because their minds were small and they had always been small. So they went around in a small world, never having the courage to think big thoughts or take big risks. Their tiny feet led them down the same little paths, never brave enough to discover big things that would make them more exceptional in the heart. McBron's written Shanks was born into a small family and lived a small, ordinary life. His small friends had a hard time saying such a large name, so he became known as Rit. Rit came from a family with a long history of being small. And as Rit got older, he lived an insignificant life, traveled the same meager path his parents had taken, and associated with other smalls who lived thought and acted small. So I'm going to pause here. We're going to go into some of the lessons of this, the journey of unconsciousness. So as you hear this, Rit didn't know what he didn't know. His life was insignificant. He kind of lived the same way that he'd always lived. And in our lives, we have behaviors that we're unconscious of. So we start acting automatically in our world, which is it can be a positive and a negative. I think of Alfred North Whitehead, he says that civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking of them. If I look at Ritt as an example of my life or your life, what Ritt has done is that he's lived unconsciously and automatically a certain way, way smaller than his potential. And this might be potential in different aspects of life, but as we look at this, this isn't about in-groups and out-groups or certain groups of people over others. It's really about that internal journey of where are you playing small in your life? Where are you being automatic? And where did those beliefs and systems come from? Because if you don't question those, they're going to play out in your world automatically. The beauty of this training is I'm going to go through this however I go through it. And my mind will free up as I do this because I, what I know is that there's a level of, of catching up mentally that I'll do as I go through this. And I'll, I'll share more information. So as you're looking at who you're being... A lot of times we don't know where our beliefs come from. I was in a conversation this morning and one of the thoughts was, if I could just figure out why I do something, then I could change it. And 
I can imagine why that would be important to want to dive into figuring out why we do things. And that's what this kind of does for you is it gives you an understanding of where, where belief systems come from, where history comes from. And so this is what goes on within your being. So your history is your story, whatever that story is. And it consists of your values, beliefs, and habits. And it's that connection between what you hold as important, your values, what you hold as dear, those thoughts and truths and beliefs that you hold as, as dear, and then the automatic behaviors that you have around those. It's from those stories that we create our perceptions. And those perceptions often affect how we see the world. And I'll go into this a little more as we move forward. But it's from those perceptions that we make predictions. So before we speak it, we play it out in our mind. And then we start to predict what will happen. It's from those predictions that we speak into the world. And it's from those speakings that we act into the world. And that creates our results. So that's our doing. And then our perception confirms those results. So we get our confirmation that, yeah, you know what? We saw the world the right way. We spoke it that way. We predicted it that way. It came out that way. And, and then we just confirm our story, our values, our beliefs, and our habits. And we just get into this automated cycle. Well, that's that could be beneficial. There might be behaviors that you have that you just run through automatically, and, and they're actually useful. We don't want to change those. We want to keep those. But if you've got behaviors and ways of being that are not useful, this is your chance to really interrupt those. So when you understand how the process works, that your story, which is all made up, uh, creates your values, so what you hold as important, and it's from those values that we create our beliefs, so what we hold as dear, and then we act on those, and those become our habits, then it creates this way of being, and then we create in the world what's going on within us. And so to change that, we really have to recognize that it's at play. So it's not about right or wrong here. It's about usefulness or powerful, not powerful, useful, not useful, is it getting you to where you want to be in your life? And that might be different for every person. So this is where I'm saying it's not about in-groups or out-groups. It's not about the giants and the smalls and creating that distinction between two groups of people. It's about your internal journey of feeling small in an area and recognizing, wow, I'm playing my life this way where I'm allowing my history to impact my values, to impact my beliefs, to impact my habits my perceptions, my predictions, my words, my actions, my results, all of it is playing from within you. And so when you can recognize that, you can start to shift it. So what we put onto the world is this way of being. So we show the world, yeah, I'm a certain way. Um, I'm positive. I'm happy. It's kind of that Facebook world. You put that up on the surface, but behind it, you have these underlying belief systems and values that really guide everything those shadow contracts, those shadow agreements, those shadow ways of being where you don't really talk about it openly. It's just who you're being on the inside shows up on the outside. So no matter what you say on the outside, who you're being on the inside affects that. It's almost like this. You want to go out and create a change. And uh, this is from a gentleman named Steve Hardison, who I based this book on. Uh, Steve Hardison says that when you don't handle the underlying is issues, it's like frosting dog poop. So it's just like putting frosting on dog crap. It's it's just that idea that until you work on the interior stuff, nothing will change on the exterior. So this is where we're going to continue with the story. So Rit is living a small life, um, really no difference in his world. And so we're going to pick up from there. So like most smalls, Rit only saw the path he was on and rarely looked up to see what else might be happening around him. One day, a burst of distant laughter high above him had him look to the sky the giants had always been nearby, but he never paid attention to them. And for some reason that day, the sight of them sparked some fascinating questions. Why are there giants? He wondered. Why are they living such giant lives while I live this small one? How did they become so massive? Is it possible for me to become a giant? These were the first giant questions Rit had ever asked. He had once heard that everyone could become a giant, but his parents' words rang in his mind. Giants are giants and smalls are smalls, and that's the way it will always be. So before I move on, so we're going to stop there. We're going to talk about possibility. So Rit doesn't know what he doesn't know. He's gone through his world being unconscious. And then he hears distant laughter and he looks up for the first time and he starts to have an awakening that something is off, an awareness that something could be different in his world if he would pay attention to it. 
And so this is our chance for growth. Um, awareness is that space that we are no longer unconscious. So things slow down. So instead of being automatic about our lives, we start to really look and reflect on our lives and start to question them and start to wonder what's possible for us. And so the, the big thing that I want to emphasize in this is I used questions in the book for this reason, is that questions are powerful at eliciting change. Sometimes if we say an affirmation, a lot of times that affirmation won't be believable. And so we might say it like frosting dog poop, right? We'll say it, but underneath we don't really believe it. So it's like we're saying the thing, but we're not being the thing on the inside. And so how do you change it? Questions are a great way to do that. Um, this video here, I might play this. Let's, let's just see for a second here. But before I go on to this, the awareness is just waking up to how we're being unconscious. And so... If we have automatic behaviors that are not serving us until we recognize they're, that they're there, there's nothing to do with it. So if we have a way of being and it's automatic and we don't know it, there's nothing to change. So when you recognize it's there, now it's hard to not see it anymore. And then we go into more of the journey. So if you watch this video, just hang with me as we go through this. It'll this instruct is an awareness to test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So no, we're not dealing with bicyclists here, but the idea here is that it's this hard is an to, awareness to, um, to change what you're not aware of. So let's, let's go back here. So if you're not aware that you're doing things a certain way, there's nothing to do. But the moment you become aware, that's where you can start to change it. And so in Ritt's life, when he's going through his life, there is no change. There, he's unconscious to it. He's being a certain way. When he becomes aware of it, then he starts to question, well, what else could I do? Do I need to do it this way? Could there be another way? This is where I want to introduce the tree of change. And so when you look at your values, right? So if we go back to that first image with the mind and you have your history, your values, your beliefs and your habits, which create your way of being. And they're confirmed by your perceptions and your predictions. I want to talk about how to shift that. So the tree of change is this. Your culture creates your foundational values. And by culture, let me identify that as your family, uh, adults in your life that maybe taught you. That could be teachers, instructors, religious leaders, um, political leaders. They, they mold who you become. So between the ages of one and 25, our brains are in development. And so our prefrontal cortex hasn't fully developed yet. And so we rely on others to act as our prefrontal cortex until ours develops, which is about by the age of 25. From the age of zero to about five months, our neurons are in a furious pace to develop. And so most of our neuro neurons are created, neural connections are created after birth. So whatever environment we're born into, our brains are designed in such a way that they can adapt to that environment. And so our culture becomes foundational to our values, our belief systems. And so the values are the things that you hold as important. So you see in the tree trunk here. So the values are the things that are important. And it is from those values that we create beliefs. Now, beliefs are the things that you hold dear. So they're the thoughts and the experiences that you anchor in and you hold on to as important. And they can be different from for anybody. So values are fairly steady for people. Beliefs are relative and subjective, so they can change through life. So we inherit these base values from our culture. And then as we have experience, we create our own values. And then from those, we create our beliefs. 
Now, our beliefs affect how we experience the world because they start to mold our perceptions. And so thoughts are options. Let's call them possibilities because you have 50,000 to 70,000 thoughts a day. And those are chemical reactions to an electrical signal based on something that happens in your environment or something that's triggered internally. And so affect is when your thoughts and emotions are impacted by something external to you. Attitude is when those are affected by something inside of you. So when something affects you, affect, it's something external that happens and it triggers all of those thoughts and emotions within you. So the emotions are the chemical signals that happen in your body to tell you to pay attention to something that there's happiness around it, anger, sadness, fear, all these emotions, these base emotions that we have are triggered by chemical signals. So we have 50,000 to 70,000 thoughts a day going through our mind. And it's our perception that that determines which thoughts we should pay attention to and our beliefs. So our beliefs can impact which which thoughts are important. And so as external events happen, internal events right here, as I, I show on the perceptions on the wall and the wind, the internal events hit the perceptions, the external events hit the perceptions. We have what's called a sensory perception filter, making this up, that term. I just needed something that was an acronym. But that filter affects what we see in the world. And so based on our beliefs and values, that perception filter will determine what we experience. It's like the monkey in that video or, or the, the dancing bears. You couldn't see it until you chose to see it. And then once you see it, you couldn't unsee it. And so as we're going through and our values and beliefs are affecting our thoughts and how we're experiencing what happens to us and what we have happen internally, those events, then we start to create from there. And that's where purpose comes in. So we start to predict from there how the world works. And it's from those predictions that we create. And it's from those creations that our reality is established. And then that reality confirms our perceptions, which anchors in our beliefs, our values, and a lot of times our culture roots us in. And so when you're looking at written the story, here is a, a guy that has spent a lifetime um, taking the values that were handed to him and is now at a space where he can actually question those and see what he wants to carry forward from here. So it's not so much about what happened in the past, it's what you do from now, because I think of the, um, the antiviral software McAfee as an example is, you know, let's say there's a virus on your computer and you don't know it. And so your computer keeps crashing. You're wondering, why is my computer crashing? You get this antivirus software and you plug it in and it pulls up and it says you've got this virus and um, it, it encapsulates it. It just guards it and, and blocks it off from doing further damage. So it grabs that virus and encapsulates it. And then from there, you're able to move forward. But we don't go in and say, well, I need to know where that virus came from and who created it, that, and then go after them in some form and trying to destroy them. That We don't need that. What we need to do is recognize that a virus is present and that it no longer has power over us. And that from there, we can move forward. And so in our lives, when we have a thought or behavior that's no longer valuable to us, we can encapsulate it, recognize that it's there. But if we don't know it's there, if we're unconscious to it, there's nothing to do with it. So as soon as we recognize it, we can encapsulate it so it doesn't cause further damage. And then we can allow space for it to be present the way that it is. It may be there forever. We may never be able to get rid of it. It's just encapsulated. So it, can't, it doesn't have any effect anymore. And so from there, we can create. So that's what we're trying to do is when you wake up to your behaviors, whatever they are, just like written the story. The idea isn't to go back and try and change time. The idea is to encapsulate what was and what is so that you can move forward. So one of the ways that Ritt really started to expand and get out of his, his old way of thinking was to ask expansive versus restrictive questions. A lot of times when we find something and we wake up to it, we go into the why of things. Why is this happening to me? Why am I always this way? Expansive questions go the other direction. What's possible for me? Why are there giants? How can I become that? Those are expansive questions. They get you into a space of curiosity, whereas restrictive questions close you off. 
So you're no longer expanding out and growing. You're actually restricting and blocking off. So you only see what is and what was. And so you stay in this rumination cycle, which brings us to the next section. So I'm going to keep reading and we'll go forward. So Rich shared his questions with some of his small friends who laughed at him. Smalls were good at belittling after all. They told him it's not possible to become a giant. You have to come from a certain ancestry or have extra special talents to be giant. Giants are unique, they said. You're just a regular old small. Ritz slumped to the curb with his head in his hands. Maybe it's easier to be small than to stand out. But inside, he knew he was more than a small. Time passed, and while traveling down the same small paths he had always taken, Ritz saw the giants and asked himself, is this all there is to life, staying small and afraid and not standing out or being different? Who would want to be small forever, he wondered. Not me, he exclaimed. I want to do more. Rip pondered how he could learn about the giants. He couldn't ask his friends and family, for they were smalls. And what do smalls know about being giants? I've got it, he said out loud. Who would know more about being a giant than a giant? I know just what I'll do. So here's uh, the next step in the giant's journey is grief. And the reason I put this in here is because Rit had a realization that his life, the way that he knew it, um, was about to change. And so there's some sadness in that. And, and in the story, I use the analogy of speaking to others and that they were belittling and they put him down. The big thing that I see is that we are the ones that do that to ourselves. Like when somebody says something external to us and that affect comes in and that event happens, we are the ones that determine based on who we're being on the inside, what that means to us. And so if it doesn't mean anything to us, there's nothing to do with this. It, it just bounces off. Um, but internally, if we believe that and we speak to ourselves that way and we say, oh, we're just small, who am I? I'm no good. Uh, I'm not smart enough. I'm dumb. You know, things like that. Then we keep ourselves small. So the reason I use the word grief right here and, and the journey of grief at this stage of the book, grief comes from the Latin word gravare to make heavy. So gravis, weighty, like gravity. And so grief is that heaviness that brings us back to reality. And so there's benefit of depression. And I want to talk about that right now, because when Rit shared his story, he slumped and he put his hand in his head, his head in his hands, and he slumped over and he felt depressed like there's no change. Nothing can change. Here's the beauty of depression. If you start looking at depression and grief as a tool to help you grow, you will never go back to disliking depression. It might not feel good, but you'll understand what's at play here. So Susan Anderson and her work, she says that when you have a major shift in your life, so she's talking about abandonment, but it also applies to depression and grief, that you have the shattering of your world the way you knew it. So Rip wakes up to the world the way it is versus what he knew. You have this withdrawal, so you pull back, right? And you have this internalization where you start to question everything. You start to wonder. And then you might have some rage, some anger. And uh, from there you lift. And if you go into the stages of death and the work around that, they say that people will go through denial. Yeah, that's not happening. They get angry. Then they start to bargain. And then they go to depression and then acceptance. And so depression, the internalizing, the rage, the, the lifting. Here's the thing is the lifting and the acceptance are the way out. But what we do is we get stuck in that cycle of just rumination. And so what happens and there are actually six of these, maybe seven R's instead of five. But when something happens in our world that transforms the way we see it, then we have this resignation. We resign from the world the way that it is. We go inside and we start to reflect and ruminate about what's going on in our world. And we start to see reality as it is and often as we are. So we see the reality as we are. And then there's a chance here to grow. What happens is people stay in that resignation, reflection, and reality, however they see it, and they don't change. They don't come out of it. So as soon as you can have a reverence for that, a revering of what is and what you're experiencing, an acceptance of what is, then you can re-engage with life. And uh, one of the other R's is to refine, to keep refining it, to get better and better at it. And the other is to get resourceful 
and your ability to work through this process is resilience, right? So your reset button. So when you go into depression, the idea here is that it's telling you that what you're doing is no longer serving you and that if you don't do something, then it could cause problems in your life. So it causes you to step back and quit putting energy into it and really reflect on it and look at reality and what's possible, have reverence for it, for the experience, because people who are depressed have more empathy than others. Uh, you re-engage with life and you refine and you get resourceful and you become resilient through this whole experience, your ability to work through that. So what depression does is it gets you into that space of saying, if I don't change something, nothing's going to change. Like Ritz looking at his world. I can't ask the smalls because what do smalls know about being giants? They haven't gone through the process of changing. So what can they teach you? What can you teach you in that space about becoming a giant? The only way out is to get into action, which brings us to another section here. So he has to get away from what is, he has to let go of what is. It's not about releasing the past or rejecting it or denying it or anything like that. Like Steve Maraboli says, it's, it's about having the wisdom to embrace the present. So what depression does and what grief does is it gets us present. It pulls us right back to here, the here and now. So it takes us out of that unconsciousness. So Rit had a decision to make. Do I stay small or do I go pursue what's possible? So as we continue in this, Rit looked at what is and he accepted it. So this is the next journey is acceptance. So acceptare means to receive willingly. So there's two parts to it. There's an allowance and accommodation within acceptance. This is from JP Morgan. And so allowance means that it's like going into a movie theater. They give you a ticket. And they allow you to be on the property and you have two hours to watch a movie or maybe longer. And then as soon as that's done, you leave the property, but you don't live there. And so you have an allowance to be on there and that's acceptance. Accommodation means that you're moving in. Like instead of just going to a movie at the movie theater, you're bringing your blankets, pillows, your dresser, all your clothes, your food, everything you're moving in accommodation. So acceptance is about receiving willingly what is Allowance is allowing it to be present for the time that it's present to give it a ticket to or license to be there. But we're trying to look at accommodation. If, if we're looking at accommodation for things that are useful for us, we don't want to chase those away. So we'll allow for those and accommodate those. But if they're not useful, then we want to look at accommodation. Are we are we keeping those as permanent? Are we giving them room and board? And so if we're accommodating negative behaviors or unuseful behaviors, then we're going to continue to grow in that way or shrink in that way where we stay small because we're accommodating the unuseful stuff. When it comes to what is, our resistance to is what causes it to persist. And so I use the analogy of a bear in the field. You're driving down the road, you see a bear in the field. You would, you would look at it and give some allowance and acceptance for it to be there. The bear is meant to be in the field. So what tends to happen is we resist it, that bear can't be in the field. Well, we're the ones driving down the road. The bear shows up and we go out there and we got to chase the bear off. You can't be here. Think about this with your emotions. So this emotion can't be here. I can't be depressed. I can't be sad. It's not allowed to be here. And so we go and try to chase the bear out of the field and we end up losing to the bear because it's bigger and stronger and faster than us and tears us up. And so if we can have some acceptance that the bear can be in the field. It can be present with us and we don't have to do anything with it. We're allowing it to be there. We can allow it to be in its space and continue working toward our space and the things we want to create. Our resistance to it, if we go out and fight it, is going to keep it from being what it needs to be. It's going to hold our attention. It's going to tear us up and we're not going to be in the path of creating our new life the way we'd like to create it. Uh, Ianla Vizant, Van Zant. She says acceptance does not mean agreement, nor does it mean we feel good about what we're facing. It means that we're willing to look for and embrace the lesson. It also indicates a willingness to grow through experience. So Brene Brown says you either walk inside your story or you own it and own it, or you stand outside your story and hustle for your worthiness. Now, there's two parts here that are being shared. You, you are what you are. You are where you are in your life. You can own that and stand in your strength, or you can stand out of sight, outside of that and resist that and fight for your worthiness from something outside of you. 
right? Acceptance, accommodation, allowance. It's just, it's really creating that space that the way you are is the way you are. What happened in your life is what happened in your life. The events that happen there, the stories that you're carrying forward are just stories. Now, the events may have happened, but what they mean to you, this is what I mean. The, what they mean to you is defining who you are moving forward. So like written the story, he could have easily stayed in the story of being small. You know what? Yeah, I am a small. All these things happen to me. I can't do anything about it. I'm a victim of circumstance. Nothing's going to change. When you're being honest, it means you're owning your story. That's it whatever that story is, and it could be different from every person. So your truth might be different from somebody else's. Your relative truth inside of you, your belief system might be different from somebody else's. You might come tell me that story. It would be believable and people would buy it and I might see it differently. But honesty is owning that, whatever that is. So when we're honest about something, we're able to look at it as it is. There's a quote in front of me that says, key in letting go is practice. Each time we let go, we disentangle ourselves from our expectations and begin to experience things as they are. That's from Sharon Salzberg. So honesty is seeing things as they are. So when you can get into the space of acceptance, you're really getting to that space of it is what it is. My life is what it is. I am who I am. And so Brad Blanton, he says, the stress that kills or cripples most of the population comes from people being too hard on themselves when they don't live up to their own imaginings about how other people think they should behave. So sometimes we do this, too. We think we know what others are thinking about us and we judge them and us from that space of what we think we know about them. But it's all made up. So we have these perceptions and these visions and values and belief systems that we put in there and they become our operating system. And then we go out and project that on the world and start judging the world from that space, not the way that it actually is. Our goal is to disentangle ourselves from that. And so when you can come to the space of acceptance, it's not saying that I'm OK with it being not OK. You know, it's, it's just saying I'm OK with not being OK. It's okay that I am where I am. It's okay that what happened happened. And then you move into the space of gratitude because what gratitude does is it, it turns your attitude around. You start to have a great attitude around life. Um, there's a show that I watch called Dude, You're Screwed. And I think it's on Netflix. And if you haven't seen it, you might check it out. They're ex-military guys who go kidnap each other and drop each other off in the middle of the the world somewhere with a few resources and they've got to make it work. They've got a target that they've got to hit and they're on their own. And so they take whatever they've got and they use that to create with. So that resourcefulness, they take what they have, they're grateful for what they have, and then they go to work on creating something different. So gratitude is really that space where you can get into not only accepting what is, but being grateful for what you have to work with. I see people who, are amputees, they're in wheelchairs, they're disabled in some form. People who feel mentally disabled, they work with what they have to create something phenomenal from where they are. So that gratitude is being grateful for what is, being grateful and thankful for what is, and using that as a foundation for growth. And so in Ritt's story, I don't have him get angry at what was. I don't have him get bitter about the world the way it was. I have him just accept that it is what it is and then move forward, which takes us into the next part of the journey, right? So when you acknowledge the good that you already have in your life, that's the foundation for all abundance. So let's continue. We're going to keep reading here. Rit steps into a new path. So the very next day, Rit packed up some small belongings in a tiny bag. He grabbed several pairs of his favorite striped socks and his hat, of course, gathered some crackers and a hunk of cheese for his adventure left the path he had always taken and journeyed to find a giant. As Rit traveled, he made up a song, and as he walked, he sang and whistled the tune. I would like to be with you, and you could be with me, and we will go on to the moon and see what we can see. When my life gets too hard to do, will you come set me free? And as you find a way to break through, will you turn around and rescue me? Because the way is not found alone, and the only way it can be won is by getting to somewhere that you've never known and do something you've never done. So the path wasn't easy for Rit. There were rivers to cross. Rit loved playing in streams, so this wasn't terrible for him. He had forests to trek and long open spaces to cross where the sun beat down on him continuously. The heat at times was unbearable, but after a long journey, every journey being long for a small, 
Rid arrived at the place where the giants lived. They seemed so magnificent. He sat quietly for a moment and watched small, fearful thoughts began to fill his head. Will they step on me? Are they going to eat me? He wondered. Who am I to ask these giants questions? Mustering up a small amount of courage and trusting that he was making the right choice, Rit shook off these fearful thoughts and moved on. Rit approached a giant. His whole body shivered as he looked up. The giant's head was well above the clouds. His clothes were larger than life, similar to Rit's, but substantially bigger. The giant's brown vest and white shirt were all that was visible through the clouds. A giant green hanky hung from the giant's back pocket. It looked like an enormous flag blowing in the wind. Rit approached the massive being and began to climb. He hung on and climbed and climbed and climbed. As he did, as he reached the giant's shoulder, Rit could no longer see the ground below. His head spun. His knees wobbled. He held onto the giant's shirt collar to keep from falling off. He'd never been so far above the ground and was hanging on for dear life. Gathering as much courage as he could, Rit climbed up to the giant's ear and yelled, Mr. Giant! So Rit steps out into uncertainty. I'm going to pause there for a second. I'm reading. He steps into the land of the unknown, a path he'd never been on before. And so what uncertainty does and why this is a journey in the giant's journeys is because it puts us in a space of knowing reality exactly as it is and seeing what's possible. So instead of seeing the reality the way that we think it is, the way we perceive it, we start to see it as it is. And then we also start to see what's possible. So Rit stepped into the unknown. And so this is what I call the certainty cycle. When we have an inspiration, a thought, an idea, information, new learning, challenges, anything in our life that gets us to wake up and we look at what's possible for our lives, we have to take some action on it. So we go into a space of faith. So Rit steps out on the path into the unknown. He goes into the space of I don't know and speculation, and it's pretty big for him. So as we start to test things, we get what's called a sense of certainty. So we do repetition and we test things. Uh, the example I use is that if you were to take a quarter and go down to Vegas, put it in the slot machine, you win the slot, the uh, jackpot in the very first pull of the handle. You could say with a sense of certainty that every time you put a quarter in the slot machine, you're going to win the jackpot. But what we know from testing is that that's not true. So testing allows us to gain certainty. It allows us to know what we can count on. So certainty is simply that space of counting on something. We know that the sun will come up. It's come up that way for millions of years. We know it will come up and it will set. Some days will be cloudy, others will not. But we all know that the sun will come up. So that becomes knowledge. And then wisdom is how do we use that knowledge? So a farmer sets his fields based on the sun, right? So that's wisdom. And then we anchor in the truths, the things that we can make automatic. So these are my truths. You know, I know every year I'm going to go plant seeds and it's going to grow a crop. And I know that through testing and repetition. So it becomes certainty. And then we might teach somebody else, and then that becomes their inspiration, their thought, their idea, and they go back through that same cycle for themselves. Now, if enough of us have that collective truth and we know what we can count on, then, then we, um, we can bypass some of that speculation. Um, but in most cases, we're going to go out there and adventure for ourselves and figure it out. And so the, the beauty is that we often seek certainty, not uncertainty, but our greatest area of growth is in the uncertainty. You know, when nothing is sure, everything is possible. And the way that you can recognize where you have potential for growth is to look at where you feel depressed. Like I'm depressed about money. I'm depressed about relationship. What that depression is saying to you, going back to the journey of grief, is that you have an awareness that there's something in your life that isn't working or serving and so that depression just says, look, this isn't working. If we don't do something about it, we might say, you know, we could feel like we're going to die in that area. Like it's it's going to hurt us. And so the depression is kind of that thing that gets you to wake up and say, look, there's something off. There's something off. And if we don't reengage with our lives, then we can get stuck in that cycle of rumination and we don't come out of it. So that depression is really meant to be a tool to wake you up that you need to do something. And this is where the work comes in. Rit had to make a decision. He could stay in the depression and ruminate about what his friends and family and neighbors all said, or he could get on the uncertain path and do something about it. He didn't try and get motivated first. He didn't jump out there and try and figure out the pathway. He packed a few things and then he got on the road and he was grateful for what he had. He just got on the road. 
And so when he gets on the road, everything is possible. He climbed higher than he'd ever been in his life right off the bat. He climbed a giant. He went to the land of the giants. He started asking bigger questions than he'd ever asked. In reality, Rit would already be growing in this story. And so when nothing is sure, everything is possible. So when there is uncertainty in your life, that's where possibility lives. So when you're feeling depressed about something, you get the chance to go out there and grow from it. And so let's continue. So he yells at the giant, Mr. Giant. There was no answer. Rit tried again. Mr. Giant. The giant looked around and said, who was that? Who said that? Rit yelled in his ear, Mr. Giant. The giant roared again. Who is that? Rit covered his tiny ears. The giant's voice shook his entire body. He could hardly understand what the giant was saying because the sound was so immense. Mr. Giant, yelled Rit, I'm a small. The giant said, a small? Here? His voice vibrating and shaking Rit. What are you doing here? I came to ask you how you became a giant. The giant, moved by the courage of this tiny being, invited Rit onto his hand. What a brave thing to do, said the giant. Rit sat against a fold in the giant's hand and looked up into his enormous eyes. The giant cleared his throat, a little choked up by Rit's bravery, and began to speak in a quieter tone. I'm impressed by your bravery. I haven't seen a small in a very long time. I'd be honored to share my story with you. Rit leaned forward as the giant continued. My parents were giants, and they knew the path to become a giant. They loved to explore the possibilities in the world around them. They dreamed impossible dreams and always thought of others and how they could best serve them. My parents' hearts were enormous. They were constantly looking for ways to improve themselves, serve others, and make their world a better place. Their giant feet took them down paths of endless possibility, and that helped them to reach their stature. Rick gasped and leaned in even closer. My friend, I need you to know that I was born a small just like you. At first said the giant. I didn't think I could measure up to my parents' stature, even though they taught me their ways from childhood. It took me years before I finally believed. When I finally started doing what they said, what they had told me all along, you know what happened? Rit looked at the giant straight in the eyes and asked, what? Well, I began to grow. What do you mean? said Rit. The giant said, you see, giants think extraordinary thoughts speak significant words and see and do remarkable things. As I began to learn, my hearing improved, my vision expanded. That's what's magical about this world. By listening to my parents and doing what they did, I started to grow. How interesting that two different versions of what parenting could look like, right? So Ritz thoughts were racing. Could this be true? This was madness. A small became a giant merely by thinking differently and making new choices. That's the difference between the giants and the smalls. Did that mean he could become a giant? There's only one way to find out, Rit thought to himself. Will you teach me how to become a giant? Rit asked. Wow, said the giant. This is a big thing you're asking me, and I don't know if you're up for the changes that will come if you go down this path. You're asking me to help you grow in a way you don't fully understand. How can I know that you'll do what it takes to grow? Rit got on his knees, hands clasped, a tingle, single tear streaming down his cheek. He said, Mr. Giant. I came here to learn about giants. I came from a long line of smalls, and I'm tired of living such an insignificant life. I believe I'm capable of more, and I want to prove myself to myself and the other smalls that anyone can become a giant. Will you please teach me? The small had come all this way and risked his life to learn something new. The giant's eyes watered. He closed his eyes for a moment, brought his hands close to his face, looked intently into Ritz's eyes and said, okay. I'll teach you what I do, but becoming a giant is up to you. Rit jumped up and down in the giant's hand, nearly falling off in his excitement. Here he was, a small, being taught by a giant. He would be able to prove that he was capable of more. His exuberance caused the giant to smile. He looked the giant right in his enormous eyes and said, My name is McBronze Ritten Shanks, but you can call me Rit. The giant said, I, my new friend, am Rimmer's Eckridge, and you can call me Remy. Remy placed Rit on the ground and began to walk away. Where's he going? Thought Rit. Remy kept going further, getting further away. Rit yelled to him, Remy, wait up. I can't walk as fast as you. Remy didn't hear him and kept walking. Rit ran as fast as he could to keep up with the giant. He was jumping and dodging as he ran with all his energy. Though Remy seemed far away, Rit wasn't about to miss an opportunity to learn from a giant. Remy walked and Rit ran for what seemed like an eternity. They came to the edge of a large cliff. Rit was out of breath and exhausted. He collapsed at Remy's feet. Remy sat down on the ground next to him. Rit yelled, what are you doing? 
No, you realize I'm just as small and can't walk as fast as you. I barely made it. Remy said patiently, yeah, I bet you made it. A small would have stayed where I left you. A small would have gone home or complained about being left behind. You didn't. You ran with everything you had to stay up with me. You're committed. That is a very giant thing to do. As Rick caught his breath, they both looked out at the cliff. Remy seemed to be enjoying the view and asked his new friend, what do you see? Rick said, I see a cliff. I don't know, some plants in the sky. Remy asked him again, what else do you see? Nothing, exclaimed Ritt. Remy laughed and placed Ritt on his shoulder. He stood up. A vast ocean spread out in front of them as far as the eye could see. Ritt could smell the ocean air and feel the breeze. It was the first time in his life he had seen such an amazing view. Remy asked him, now what do you see? Ritt couldn't speak. The view was so breathtaking that all he could do was look. Remy said, Ritt, a giant sees what a small might never see. A giant sees the beauty in everything while a small misses out on seeing the splendor that surrounds them. A giant sees opportunity in every moment and a small only focuses on his or her problems. Rit looked up at Remy and said, I wanna see what a giant sees and do what a giant does. So as we go into the journey of vision, we've gone through unconsciousness, awareness, grief, acceptance, uncertainty. Now we're going into vision. And this is why this is important. We get so stuck in our lives the way that they are that we want somebody to come rescue, like written this song. You know, it's, will you come along and rescue me? That's what the smalls believe. Come rescue me. We get so stuck in that. We want to be rescued from our situation, not realizing that we're the ones with the power. And as soon as we can rise above it and have vision for our lives, then we can start to change and transform it. So Nathaniel Brandon, he says, no one's coming to save you. No one is coming to make life right for you. No one is coming to solve your problems. If you don't do something, nothing is going to get better. This might be hard to hear for some people, but our greatest rescuer isn't somebody outside of us. It's ourselves. In the story of the uh, Munchausen, uh, he was stuck in the bog. He was drowning. His horse was drowning. He was yelling for help, somebody to come rescue him. And nobody was coming. And so he picked himself up by the ponytail and pulled himself and his horse out of the water and set themselves on the dirt to safety. And so that's kind of in a way what we're doing here is we're learning that the power to transform is within us. And so when Remy puts Rit on his shoulder and stands up and shows him what's possible, Rit starts to see possibility from a new view. And even in your, your giant's journey, as you're going along, you're going to feel like you're doing the work, you're getting busy. I think Stephen Covey talks about working the, the chainsaw or sharpening the saw, and then you're cutting down the forest and you find out you're in the wrong forest. You know, and as much as you can rise above, take a giant's view of your life and really have vision for your life and make sure that what you're doing, what you're acting on is in alignment with the vision that you have for yourself, then you start to create your life differently. Now, I ask this question a lot. Who here has the brain of Einstein? And barely any hands go up when I ask that question. But the reality is that you have the same brain as Einstein. You have the same brain as Remy the giant. We all do. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of science here. So there's a research study done on, on Einstein, not only Einstein's brain, but uh, cab drivers in London versus bus drivers in London. What happened with Einstein is he had developed his neocortex and his hippocampi, the, the area that stores memory, and neocortex is the area that manipulates memory. So in these areas, he had built it to such a degree that he could manipulate it in a way that he would create the theory of relativity. Now, Einstein, I don't know if you knew this, was an insurance salesman. He was terrible at it. So when it came to insurance sales, he had not developed in that area. So he never fully became that. But when it came to um, relativity and thinking that through, he became a giant in that area. And so in the study of cab drivers in London, they found that the hippocampi were bigger in the cab drivers than they were in the bus drivers. The bus drivers took the same path every day. They didn't have to think it through. It was the same routine over and over. It was automated and they had smaller hippocampi because of it. The cab drivers had to take not only the map, but know how to manipulate the map to create the paths that they wanted to create. So their, their memory store was bigger and their ability to manipulate that memory store was bigger. And so the brain had accommodated to increase those areas, just like working a muscle so that they could do that more effectively. And so our Brains and bodies are designed to support us. This is a neuron. 
So the neuron has the um, oligodendrocytes that are connected to it. It has astrocytes, microglia. It's not just the neuron. These glial cells are the things that support the neuron to make it more efficient. So neuron fires in one direction. And as it fires, it, it creates and connects with another neuron. And that creates our behaviors, our thinking patterns. We have 86 billion of these in our brain. And we have about two to three times that amount in glial cells. So Einstein had a similar number of neurons to you and me, but he had more glial cells than the average person in certain areas of his brain. When it comes to your brain, your brain is no different from Einstein's or the cab drivers. It's all about what you're choosing to exercise it as. So the fastest firing neuron in the brain is 268 miles per hour. It's faster than a Bugatti Veyron at full speed. The slowest is one mile per hour. And so the reason for that is this myelin sheath that runs along the axon of the neuron. So as it fires, that myelin sheath causes it to fire faster and faster. And so that is created by what's called an oligodendrocyte. So it comes in and says, okay, that, that new behavior is important. Let's make it efficient. And so when you start to create a new behavior and you start to use it over and over again, then these support cells come in and they say, we're going to support you in supporting that behavior. So the oligodendrocytes make it fire faster and faster by creating a myelin sheath. The astrocytes go in and they wrap the synaptic connections so that they're more efficient. So you're not losing chemicals as it bounces from one synapse to the other. And so it acts almost like a bridge in a way between the neurons and it encapsulates the synaptic connections so that they fire more efficiently. And then you have microglia that go in and clean up any dead neurons, neural tissues, extra chemicals. They just keep the brain clean. And that's these small things that you see around there. So these glial cells, these glial cells are as important as the neurons themselves. So 86 billion neurons, just like Einstein, and two to three times that number of glial cells to support you. Your brain is already supported. So as you create a new behavior, I tell my clients, in order to get what you want out of life, you've got to be willing to suck at something long enough to get good at it. And these glial cells are the things that go in there and help you get good at it. They take it from a conscious behavior to automation. And going back to Alfred North Whitehead, he said that it's the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking by which civilization advances. And this is how that occurs in your brain. So as you're doing a behavior and it's firing those signals, your oligodendrocytes, your astrocytes, your microglia, they all come in to support that and make you more and more efficient in that new thing. So it's not that you don't have the brain for it. You just have underdeveloped areas of your brain. You can do literally anything. You have the ability with your brain to store all of the books that were ever written from the beginning of time to the end of time and you would still have space left over inside of your single brain. You could watch 3 million hours of Netflix and store it inside of your brain. You have the same brain as Einstein, as those cab drivers. The difference is the usage and what you're doing with it. When we go back to the history of Ritt, when he was playing small, he's living a small life, and that was his belief system. Then his brain said, you got it. We support you in that. And it created that as his reality, just like the bus drivers in that study. And so that automation kept him small. And so the only distinction, the difference between you and a giant is your willingness to, to shift those stories and those beliefs and those values and to start to perceive the world different, predict the world different, to practice that. That practice is what's going to create that automation. So here's the other thing is not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. So if you think about this, the universe we are inside of the universe. We are created from the universe. All of the materials of the universe are ours to use, to manipulate, to transform into anything that we can imagine. And you look at what is today in technology versus what was possible back in the 1900s, 1800s. What is as a reality for us wasn't even a possibility back then. So, this is where you start to expand. You start to see, man, I'm the one telling myself I can't be a giant. I'm the one that believes I don't have the brain for it. I'm the one that is my rescuer. Now, we lean on other people. We love being around other people. We need that support. We are designed for social connection. But the individual journey is what creates a better social connection. When we are running properly, just like the neurons, you have a faulty neuron the rest of the neurons around it could be impacted. 
in your world, if you work on you, your social connections improve, your world improves, you start to grow in ways you could never imagine. So let's continue with the story here. So the sun was going down, Remy had told Rick, go home, think about the lessons you've learned, come back tomorrow. He carried Rick back to where they had met and Rick headed home. That night as Rick slept in his small bed, he had giant dreams for the first time. So the next morning as he sat up in his bed, he banged his head on the ceiling. He fell backward. His arm broke through the window. His small bed smashed to pieces beneath him. What's going on? He howled. During the night, he had grown. By thinking giant thoughts and dreaming giant dreams, he had actually grown. He stood up from his broken bed. He hit his head on the ceiling again. He ran out to the front door, squeezed out, breaking it to smithereens. Rit ran as fast as he could to the land of the giants. Stopping every giant he saw to ask for his new friend, Remy. He approached Remy's home and pounded on the door frantically. Remy, he yelled. Remy, open up. It's me. Remy opened the door casually and looked at his friend. Wow, he laughed. You've grown. I know I've grown, said Rit. My house is destroyed. And I don't fit in anymore. I don't know what to do. Rit looks at him. Remy looks at him. The life you knew will never be the same, said Remy. And this is just the first step in becoming what you say you want to become. It's up to you whether you want to keep growing. What would you like to do? Rick closed his eyes, shrugged his shoulders and sighed. Shaking his head back and forth, he looked up at Remy and said, well, I don't want to go back and I definitely don't want to stay like this. I'm neither a giant nor a small. I want to keep going. Satisfied, Remy smiled and invited his friend inside. Let's eat some breakfast and we'll get to our next lesson. Okay, so we're going to pause here. So the vision, right? Remy teaches Rit about vision. Rit has vision for his life. He sees what's possible for him. He goes home and he has giant dreams for the first time in his life. So going back to the idea when nothing is sure, everything is possible. Rit has giant dreams for the first time in his life and there's nothing to do but have the dream and he starts to grow. So as soon as you start to grow and we'll go into abundance here in a minute. Um, actually, we'll go into abundance now. So I'll read that next here. But as soon as he starts to dream and have vision, he starts to grow. Let me continue this next part, and then we'll go into abundance as well. So Riv walked into the biggest home he'd ever seen. It was a home built for a giant. Remy invited him to sit at the table. Riv had never seen so much food. He was used to small pea soup and crackers, and here in front of him was more food than a small could imagine. Fruits and pastries, fresh meats, and the most excellent vegetables. Remy instructed him to eat all he wanted. There was more than enough. Rit ate and ate and ate. He ate the fruits, he ate the vegetables, he ate the meats and pastries, and as he did, he grew a little bit more. He asked, why am I growing? Remy said, Rit, a giant sees the abundance of the world. He's grateful for the things that a small doesn't even see. A giant knows that there's more than enough of everything for everyone, and a small does not. There's enough to share, and if something runs out, I can produce more. So Rit thought about what Remy had said and finished his meal, his belly bulging, his belt buckle loosened. He'd never thought about abundance. Smalls were always saying that there wasn't enough of anything. He never considered the idea that if one thing ran out, he could make more. He was beginning to see the plenty that surrounded him. He stood up from the table and walked to the window. He was, Remy, he asked, how is it that you have so much while the smalls have so little? Follow me, Remy said. He walked steadily outside to a large garden. Rip followed. He'd never seen such enormous plants and fruit trees. There were rows and rows of fruits and vegetables, a small farm filled with animals. We're going to pause right there. Um, the journey of abundance and surrender. So this is what we're going to talk about. In one sense, Rit has a vision and he has to surrender. In the other, he has to recognize the abundance of the world around him. And so abundance isn't something that we acquire. It's something that we tune into. If you think about this, the universe is already infinite and abundant. Those are the default settings of nature. The, all of the molecules, all of the atoms were already created. In fact, in your human body alone, there are 6.8 octillion atoms in a single human body. 6.8 octillion. There are about, I want to say, 5 trillion or more than that. There's 5 to the 10th power or the 25th power of, of molecules. And when it comes to cells, there's over 56 trillion cells in a single human body. 
you have 86 billion neurons. I mean, we're talking numbers that are unfathomable. There are 7 billion people on the earth right now. So you have 56 trillion cells and 86 billion neurons. And if those were people, imagine how many worlds it would take to fill the space that we're talking about here. But you had to do nothing to create those. The molecules for the oxygen that you breathe in today were already there. Your body just took it, transformed it from one form into another, transformed it from oxygen to carbon dioxide. And so you didn't have to do anything but breathe it in. When it comes to money, the money that you need is out there. It's transformed from the way that it is into something that you need. Elon Musk, if you think about him flying to Mars, he didn't have to create Mars for him to fly there. He didn't have to create the molecules that he needed to create the spaceship and the rocket fuel to fly in there. He had to transform it from the form that it was in into a new form. So the life that you've looked at and lived in a certain way, the abundance that you need to change it to something else is already there. There's a story of a monk who was telling his and another monk that he wanted to build an ashram. And he said, where are you going to get the money? And he said, I'll get it from wherever it is. And that's how this works. Abundance isn't something to go create. There's more than enough out there. All of the resources that we've needed to create rocket ships have already been there. And it took our ability to have vision and transform things from one form to the other to create it the way that it is. So abundance is this idea of transforming things from our vision, who we're being. We speak them and predict them into the universe and affect the the atoms and the molecules and the quarks and the, the neutrinos and the protons and electrons and everything. And then we take those molecules and we transform them into something different. And that, that confirms our reality. And we do that over and over again. We predict our world. We say that it is a certain way. We start to act as though it is a certain way. We create it as though it's a certain way. And then it confirms our perceptions and we, we create more and more of it. And so what is today, going back to that idea, wasn't even a possibility back in the day. So at first dreams seem impossible. Then they go to improbable. Then they go to inevitable. So when we're looking at creation and what's possible for us and we look at vision, we continue that. The abundance that we need to create the world that we want is already there. We didn't have to create the atoms. We didn't have to create the molecules. We didn't have to create the quantum physics behind it all the observation, the consciousness, all of that is already there. It's our job to transform it from one form to another. Our job is to transform our lives from what they are and what they have been to something different. And it's within each of us. And the pinnacles to climb are endless. So there is no limit to the giant you can become. When you become a giant in one area, you might go back to an area where you feel small, where you feel depressed and change that and transform that into giant. And then when you get that peak, you're gonna go back and find another one. So the pinnacles are endless. Looking at the idea of surrender, to render over to another, surrender, to turn over to the universe, to turn over to God or your higher self or your higher way of being and trust that the mechanics of what you wanna create will figure themselves out. When you start to have visions like that, it's like trying to unpop a popcorn seed. There's no putting you back in the shell. It's your personal big bang. There's no putting the universe back to that single point. It's not going to happen. Once it's expanded out at such a rapid pace, there's no putting it back. So when you surrender to your ability to create and you surrender to the idea that there's more than enough out there for you to create anything that you want, that you didn't have to go through and create the mechanics for your dream, but you had to hold the vision and follow the paths and prepare to receive whatever it is you have in mind, that's where your life really starts to transform. Because what we tend to do is say, well, that's not for me. And we have these stories and beliefs that say we can't do it. And therefore, all we can perceive is that can't doing. And so that's what we create in our world, which creates our reality and confirms our perceptions and our stories and our values and beliefs and our habits. And so nothing changes. When you start to realize that you are powerful and capable of all things and that all things that are needed for you to create that are already there and you can transform them from whatever form they're in into something different, then you start to act different in your life. When you realize you're the rescuer, that's when things start to change. Steve Jobs says that you can't connect the dots looking forward. So when we create our vision, what we often try to do is create from the how. So I want to have a goal and I'm going to do it this way. And then when that way fails, we give up on it because it's not God's way or it wasn't meant to be or whatever it is that we say. 
Our job is not to know the how in every case. Our job is to hold the vision and prepare to receive it. The how will work itself out. He's, he says you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. And so as you're creating your vision, don't worry about the how. Just create the vision as clearly as you can see it. Rise above your life the way that it is. Envision it the way that you would like it to be. Prepare a space to receive it the way you would like it to be and let the dots connect themselves. If you look at it like goal setting like a tree, this is how I would look at it. Trees are beautiful as a whole. Individually, you might see some bifurcations and some chaos. But what happens is a tree moves on a certain path. It'll branch out. It'll bifurcate. and It'll reach out to where it needs to go for the flow. And all of it receives from the environment around it. It transforms the air into something different. It transforms the carbon dioxide in the air into oxygen. And it uses it for itself. It takes in sunlight, transforms that into energy and glucose and sugar. And, and puts it back out into the world in the form of fruit or oxygen. And it follows whatever path it needs to take for it to do that. Every tree is different. It's like a fingerprint. So as you're going in your life and you're looking at your vision, your vision is going to look a lot like this tree. You're not going to know the path looking forward, just like Steve Jobs said. Your job is to hold the vision and then from that vision to follow the path as it comes. And this is where the work comes in. So let's keep reading here. You guys are doing good. So they asked Remy, what, what are you doing? Remy said, we, we are working in the garden. This is where the food you were eating came from. A giant works to earn the things he has or she has. And you, my friend, will be working with me today. We'll be pulling weeds and taking care of the plants, the fruit trees, and the animals. Suddenly, Rit noticed not only the plants, but the weeds. They were gigantic. How in the world could a small pull such big weeds and take care of such a large garden, he thought. Remy handed Rit some gloves and started working. Rit did too. He tugged and tugged on those weeds. At first, they wouldn't budge. His hands hurt and were swollen and blistered. A giant beetle jumped out, and Rit fell over backwards trying to get out of the way. He started laughing as he realized it had no interest in him. Rit had never worked so hard in his entire life. The task felt impossible, but the more he worked, the stronger he got, the easier it became, and the bigger he grew. They spent the whole day working. Rit was covered in dirt and sweat and smelled worse than the animals. You did well, Remy said. It was hard for you at first, but the more you did it, the better you got. A giant knows that when he starts something new, he won't be very good at it. If he's willing to keep doing it, his skills will improve until one day he can do it without thinking. Remy, can I ask you something? Remy said, yeah. Rit said, can you? Yes, Remy said before Rit could finish. Rit looked at him confused. How can you say yes if you don't even know what I'm going to ask? Remy said, there's nothing you can ask that's bigger than me. I can do anything you ask. The question is, will I? Rit thought about that. There's nothing this giant can't do. That sounds impossible. How can he do everything? He was so stunned by Rit's, Remy's answer, he'd forgotten what he was going to ask. Rit was still thinking about what Remy had said when Remy spoke. Rit, you have the same gift. In fact, all smalls and giants can do anything. Smalls tell themselves all the reasons why they can't do something, and that keeps them from becoming giant. So the journey of nurturing is it's going to take some effort. For you to create your life differently, you are going to have to step into it. The idea of depression is that depression isn't changed by motivation. Depression is changed by action. And so when you get depressed in your life and you start to see things as where they maybe shouldn't be, it's a chance for you to really see reality as it is and, and step into your garden, so to speak, just like written the story. So these words that are, are spoken by Remy to Rit are words that my mentor, Steve Hardison, shared with me years ago, about 11 years ago. And I had asked him that very question. He said, there's nothing that you can ask that's bigger than me. And he clarified for me later on that it wasn't that he could do it in some form of arrogance. It was that he had the ability to create it. And where he didn't have that ability, he could lean on others to help create that collectively and that there was nothing out of his reach. And as you look at your giant potential, the smalls tell themselves all the reasons why they can't do something. 
I don't have the brain for it. I don't have the history or the bloodline for it. I can't do it because I'm just a small. Who am I to be special? And the giants are sitting there looking at it. There's nothing I can't do. And so you must nourish your garden like a mother. This is Jim Rohn, but you've got to protect it like a father. Your garden is opportunities or business or dreams or simply the season of spring. It's a, it's a noun that means to care, the care and attention given to someone or something that is growing or developing. So nurture. So when you're looking at your new life and you're growing it, if you keep digging it up, it's going to be hard. You plant the seed. You got to trust that it's going to grow into what it needs to be. Like Steve Jobs says, your job isn't to connect the dots looking forward. It's to trust that the dots will somehow connect. Your job is to hold the vision. When you plant that garden, the vision that you have in mind is that it will yield fruit one day. When you have the vision for your life, the idea is that it will yield the fruit one day and that you'll do whatever work is needed to nurture and take care of that garden. I put this in here for a reason. I wanted to teach my kids that their lives are earned, that they're not entitled to whatever they see out there, that they get to go create it. And so nurturing is one of those things is a path of constant energy that you're putting energy into your world and you're surrendering to the pathways that appear that as they branch out and they expand in whatever direction they go in, that you trust that and you act on that. Benoit Mandelbrot, he's, he's an inspiration to me. His mathematical equation says that um, when simple things are repeated, they create complexity. So he says, bottomless wonder spring from simple rules, which are repeated without end. This is the Romanoff broccoli. You can see simple rules repeated and it creates complex beauty. Our lives look self-similar. Every day looks similar to the last. But that repeated self-similar behavior with slight changes over time creates complexity. Your neurons start to support you as you repeat the behavior. They start to support you and you grow in capacity. See, giants still take small steps. They take small steps. They're just bigger. And so in your life, as you're looking to change your life, you're, you're taking small steps in a new direction. You're, tr you're bifurcating, you're branching like a tree as you're reaching for your goals. The sun shines its energy every day. Only a billionth of its energy hits the earth, but that billionth of its energy is enough to make an impact. Uh, the, the artist, I'm, I'm thinking of the artist, the painter, um, Van Gogh. Van Gogh painted 50,000 paintings. Only 1% of his paintings ever became fam famous, but he painted every day. 50,000 paintings. About 100 are talked about, about 1%. Um, so as you, as you grow in capacity, you want to get to the point where your current capacity is filled, and then you grab a bigger container. So you stretch a little further. So fill a container and then get a bigger container. So grow in the capacity to the person that can create what you're talking about. Your current reality does have a say, but you can lift the anchor. So think about that. Where you are is where you are. When you can accept that going into the journey of acceptance, you can have grief over what was and what is not and the ideals that should be. But you have gratitude about what is. And then you step into the uncertainty and you hold that vision and you surrender to the pathway. So you, instead of trying to dictate and predict the pathway, you surrender that the pathway will appear and that the best path for you to reach that goal will appear. Then you lean on the abundance that's out there and you put effort into it daily. You start to grow in capacity. Charles Darwin says it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. Isn't that interesting? I've always heard of the survival of the fittest. That's not what he said. It's survival of the most adaptable. And so as the world changes, how are you going to adapt to it? If the world is falling apart or seems to be falling apart around you, how are you going to adapt to it? It might take you years to grow. Like the bamboo grows underground for three years before it sprouts up, and then it has astronomical growth within a short period. But a lot of the development occurred unseen, underground. In your world, you've got to trust the process. So part of that is keeping yourself feeling good as you go through it. So this is another part I put into the book for a reason is because we're going to have difficult emotions and learning to manage those is important. So let's keep going here. So Randy and Rick continued working in the garden into the woods. In their deep conversations and hard work, work they lost track of time. The sun went down and it was time to head home. As they walked through the forest, Rick couldn't see his hand in front of his face. He cautiously felt his way through the trees and vines. Rick's pants snagged on a thorn and he fell behind. He heard a flutter. His heart started pounding and his stomach got tingly. 
A twig cracked nearby, and the hair on the back of his neck stood up. He imagined all of the frightening things that could be around him. Suddenly, something brushed across his face. He screeched, swinging his hands wildly in front of him to get it away. He broke away from the thorn and started running wildly through the trees. He wondered what kind of creature was trying to get him, never realizing that this frightening encounter was just a leaf hanging from a branch. Rick could hear Remy walking in front of him, but couldn't see him. He followed as quickly as he could. It felt like he was walking forever in the darkness, but he kept moving. He didn't want to be left behind. As he caught up with Remy, tattered from the woods, Rick said, short of breath, you didn't seem afraid as you walked through that. You just kept going. Remy turned. Rid, I do get afraid occasionally, but a giant keeps moving and doesn't allow fear to stop him from doing what he can do. Giants know that allowing fear to overtake them can make them smaller. This was a new thought for Rit. He knew he could grow, but he hadn't considered the idea that fearful thoughts could make him shrink. Smalls allow their imaginations to create scary stories about all the bad things that could happen. Giants put positive things in their minds and move forward despite their fears. A giant knows that all fears are stories that we've made up. We can make the stories as scary or as beautiful as we would like. If I'm in a place that I don't know or that might be scary, I make up a positive story in my mind and things turn out just fine. That was a relief to Rit. He, looked, he liked the idea of making new stories and certainly didn't want to shrink. Making a new narrative sounded fun. So instead of imagining all the scary things in the darkness, he simply made up a new story. In place of terrifying creatures and monsters, he pictured happy little animals playing hide and seek in the dark. He imagined them laughing and telling stories with thoughts of him joining them in the silliness. And as he visualized this, he grew. So emotions are important. This is one of the journeys, the journey of feeling good. The reason this is important is because our emotions are constructions of the world, right? They're not reactions to the world. They're constructions. So they stem from thoughts. Every emotion stems from a thought. And those thoughts stem from perceptions and beliefs and values. And so from those, we create a response to the world. So Lisa Feldman Barrett says that an emotion is your brain's creation of what your bodily sensations mean. So we give meaning to things in relation to what's going on around you in the world. Numerous experiments showed that people feel depressed when they fail to live up to their own ideals, but when they fall short of the standards set by others, they feel anxious. And here's the paradox is that we feel like we're not measuring up to the standards set by others, but it's also our projection of our ideal of what we think others are thinking of us, by which we judge ourselves and from there we shrink. And so learning how to manage our emotions is going to give us our power back. So fear is a story that's supported by your emotions and realized in your actions. So when you feel fear, you've had a thought based on your beliefs and values, and then that's where you're predicting from. And that's what you put out into the world and that becomes your reality and that confirms your perceptions. And so what if you're wrong? What if the story that you're telling isn't accurate? What if it's different? What if it could play out a little different? So the idea of the bus, emotions are going to come up. You're going to have angry emotions. You're going to have fearful emotions. You're going to feel happy. They will come and go. They're chemical responses to things that you're thinking or perceiving in the world around you. So when they come up, just like the bus, they're allowed to be passengers on the bus. You are the driver of the bus. So as you're driving along and let's say anger comes up, and this is from a video on YouTube, that you could allow anger to rule and you can engage with anger and fight anger and try and kick anger off the bus. But what happens is you stop driving. And when you stop driving the bus, you stop going towards what you wanted to create. And so if you can allow anger to be present and accept that it's present and allow for it to be present, on the bus that it belongs there, then you can keep driving the bus and eventually anger will sit down because it's a chemical response. And as it sits down, you start to step back into your power. So you have a way of being that has gravity. So as we do things over and over, they create mass in our lives. And as they have mass, they have gravity. So they have an impact on what happens around us. So your way of being has created gravity in your life, just like the earth in this image. And your new way of being is like the moon. And for a period, the earth will pull the moon back into its gravity and they will collide until the moon or your new behaviors gain mass. And then the gravity of the old ways no longer has an impact over them. So your job is to stick with things long enough for them to gain mass, to allow your body to support you, to start practicing in such a way that they become 
their own mass, that they start to gain their own gravity and you start to shift your life. Um, when it comes to anxiety, Barry McDonough is one of my favorites. Uh, he says, as strange as it sounds, the greatest obstacle to healing your anxiety is you. You're the cure. In essence, you must learn to get comfortable in your anxious discomfort. The secret to recovery, however, is that once you reach a point where you really allow and accept it, it begins to fall away and discharge naturally. This is where we get back into our power. To be empowered is to be in full power. When you are anxious or depressed, your brain starts to shut down. It's a chemical response. It shuts down. You don't have your cognitive functions. When you can relax and allow for what is, the depression, the anxiety, the heavy emotions, the anger, as they come up, when there's an allowance for it, it means they have a ticket to be there. Then it allows you to calm down. And as you calm down, you get your brain back. You get back in power. And so learning that emotions are going to be a part of your life, that you're going to have heavy emotions and knowing how to work with them to create a toolbox around how to work with these emotions is going to be impactful for you because it's going to put you back in your power, which brings us to our final section here in final journey service. Okay. So Rit worked in every moment to do his best in everything he did. He worked every day at becoming a giant. In the time he built an enormous home, planted himself a prodigious garden, and be began sharing his adventure with other smalls. As many of the smalls wondered what happened to Rit after they discovered his house in shambles, many of the smalls learned from Rit and also became giants. Rit had a lot of adventures with his friends, Remy, his friend Remy, and learned the ways of the giants. It wasn't easy. And it took a lot of energy and effort for him to choose each day, whether he was going to be small or a giant, whether he would do giant things, ask giant questions, make giant decisions, or continue playing life as a small. In the end, Rick grew and grew and grew and became a giant among giants. So there's power in mentorship. Having Remy as a giant mentor was huge. It helped Rick to bypass some of the, the challenges of learning. There's a story of the, the gentleman that wanted to solve the Rubik's Cube. It took him 26 years to figure out the algorithms. And this is at a time of YouTube and videos and how to, uh, a time when the fastest time the Rubik's Cube had been solved at that time was 7.5 seconds. Now it's down to three and a half seconds by a human is the quickest time. So here's a gentleman that wants to do it on his own, DIY, do it yourself or in a time where all of those resources are available to them mentors have the ability to help us shortcut some of those processes is really important to lean on a mentor. I had a mentor. I still have mentors. I still go to courses because these people have learned things in ways that I haven't yet learned where I can shortcut that certainty cycle and work through it a lot quicker. Um, Oprah Winfrey has mentors. She says a mentor is someone who allows you to see the hope inside of yourself. A mentor is someone who allows you to know that no matter how dark the night and the morning joy will come. A mentor is someone who allows you to see the higher part of yourself when sometimes it becomes hidden to your own view. Rit became a mentor to other smalls. He went back and served the other smalls. He went back and taught them and shared with them what he had learned. You guys will do that with your kids, with friends, family, with yourselves. You're going to take what you learned in this course and you're going to carry it back into your life and your lives will never be the same. They're going to be impacted in a positive way. Um, we all have unlimited potential regardless of the challenges. You, you were made for greatness. I want you to hear this because we interview people weekly with all different backgrounds, some with disabilities, some with abuse and trauma in their lives, some with stories that you can't even imagine. And regardless of where their start point was, they recognize their potential and are stepping into it daily. Some are different sizes in their giant journey. They're doing different things. They have different views and important visions that they're putting into the world, but they are unlimited in their capacity and their potential. And so when you recognize that regardless of what your life was or regardless of what your life is, that it could be something bigger then you will create it differently. And that's the message of this book is that you can do anything you decide to do. And so that's the end of this presentation. And as I recap here, I just want to recap the journeys that we go from the journey of unconsciousness to awareness, from awareness to grief, from grief to acceptance and gratitude, 
from gratitude and acceptance to uncertainty, from uncertainty to vision, from vision to surrender and abundance, to nurturing, to feeling good, and to giving back. And that there will be times where you're looking at your journey and what you're creating in your life. Let your depression guide you to where you're feeling small. Let depression guide you to where you have an opportunity for growth. And then remember to keep yourself feeling good as you step into the unknown and give yourself some grace and patience for the transformation that will occur. Everything you want to create in your life is already there. It's already available to you. So as we wrap up this training, I mean, an hour and a half, if we, uh, if we had some commentary in here, you would, we would we'd probably go two hours on this training. But this gives you a sense of the 12 journeys that when you want to become a, a giant in your life, whatever it is, you're going to go through these 12 journeys and you can recognize where you are in the journeys based on what you're experiencing. So go back through to the journey that you need and re-listen to that and pull that into your life, whether that's uncertainty, whether that's allowance and, and acceptance, whether that's grief and gratitude or vision, determine where you're at and go back to that journey and re-listen and implement that into your life. If you scan the, the code on the screen here, that'll take you to our courses and programs that we're running. And so I would invite you to do that. If this speaks to you to go further with this, to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, it would be phenomenal to, to do that with you and just sit with you in conversation and have you experience what it's like to be coached, not only by me, but by other giants in our group that have, have transformed themselves through these 12 journeys and really have you experience the 12 journeys um, so that you can see, I mean, that, that single conversation might create it in such a way that, that you would never have to have another conversation in your life and you'd be able to change. And that's the power we're trying to create. And as part of our programs, that initial conversation is always free. So we want you to experience it and see if that's something you want to continue more than anything. So there's no obligation to do that ever with any of our programs. Hopefully from this video, you might even take from this video what you need to create the life of your dreams. And so go out there, share the book. If you haven't read The Giants and the Smalls, go through and read. This is why this is such a powerful book in the world is because it teaches you how to become a giant, how to take responsibility, it teaches children to do that for themselves while they're in development. It teaches adults who weren't taught that how to redevelop those underdeveloped parts of themselves so they can become giants and fill in the gaps from their childhood. And so I appreciate you watching. Again, if uh, if you get a chance, uh, do a screenshot of that or go to giantsandsmalls.com. You'll see that scrolling at the bottom there. This has been The 12 Journeys, How to Be a Giant. I'm Nicholas Townsend-Smith, and I appreciate your time. Go make it a giant day.